You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. And to follow the swimming rules. You're always looking out for me and trying to keep me safe. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? Here in the garage. Closet. Show box under the bed. Where anyone can get to it. How safe is that? How safe is that? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules. Now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. If you own a firearm and are not using it, please be responsible and be sure that it's stored in a safe place. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. The entertainment world was in shock today as popular children's hero Barney, the friendly T-Rex, went berserk on a Hollywood lot. Tossing young children aside with his purple tail, the entertainer, who once made his living from being a crowd scene extra in dinosaur movies, was heard to cry, I must get back to my roots. Unsubstantiated rumor has him seeing Jurassic Park earlier that day. I'm Adam Firecat, and I'm public access, and so are you. Hi, with us today is Barbara Nimri Aziz, who does a program called Radio Tahrir. And that is on WBAI Radio in New York City. And how are you today? I'm Delighted to meet you, Richard, and to be in Arkansas, my first visit to Arkansas. Yeah, you know, once you're in Arkansas, you can never leave. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is that a threat or it's promise? Not, it's not, I don't know. It's not, I think it's a state law. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your radio program? It's a weekly program. It's an hour. It's been running since 1992 as a weekly hour-long program. Tahrir means liberation. The subtitle of the program is Voices of the Arab Muslim Community Here and Abroad. It began focusing only on the Arab, Arab Americans and Arabs across the world. Right. And then after 1998, when there was greater interest in Muslim peoples, and I say 1998, not 2001, because, of course, Pacifica is in the vanguard anyway, Right. my boss asked me to expand the content in the area I cover for that hour to include Muslim. But my area of knowledge and what I prefer to do is still the Arab. So it tends to be a little more of that. I mean, look at the Muslim world is from Uyghur in China yeah. to African Americans right. to the early slaves to uh, Pakistan and all parts of the world. You right. know, there are Hispanic Muslims. I mean, it's so vast that I don't feel I can cope with all that. So, but we try. We try to do uh, something that we find others are incapable of or not interested in, and that is to focus on the Muslim voice. 
all my programming is very positive, very proactive. I'm not interested in doing the latest um, dispute over right. the hijab yeah. or the minaret or uh, some kind of violence. Yeah. There is enough of that, whether it's done sympathetically or well, is not my concern. Right. Uh, our voices as Americans, yeah. as people that can relate to listeners, right. is simply not heard enough. So that's what I concentrate on. And I, I love it. I enjoy it very much. Uh, I should just add that a major thrust of my work has been with writers and artists. Yeah, and there really? are increasing number of writers from the Arab world and within the United States who are writing on subjects related to our history, but also part of the greater literary tradition. And we do a lot of programs uh, on writers, and I like to do that. Uh, you've written a lot about writers who um, may not necessarily be covered by the mainstream um, in America, who just seem to be ignored by uh, most of Western wor the Western world. Why do, you think that, why do you think that is? I think it may be related to the fact that um, when it comes to Arab, whether they're Arab Americans or Arabs outside, we are still a curiosity. And we are uh, focused on, often in a time of crisis, right. or related to some drama, yeah. a victimization or war, etc. And when something titillating comes up, um, which could be, which could have to do with women's mm, abuse, which could have to do with a war situation, right. a victim, then the media uh, is more interested. I and think that's a fact of life. Right. And of course, people love to seem to, to, to uh, focus in on abuse. Love it. Particularly Absolutely love of it. Uh, Arab and Middle Eastern women. Nowadays, yes. Yeah, and uh, one of the things you've written about are West, about Western feminists in particular. Yes. Who seem to have taken up the standard of writing and focusing on abuse. And you've written, you may, written a number, you've talked about a number of books in which uh, they seem to open up with, uh, their opening chapters seem to open up with women being treated horribly. And that seems to set the tone for the entire book, the entire story. Uh, yes, it does. Not only, not only are the women uh, in the book abused, but the men are, set, are seen as primarily abusers. They're bad guys. They are bad guys. So do you want me to elaborate on let's, this? Let's, I'm let's glad go. Let's go with this. It looks as this. if you understand what I'm saying. I consider myself a feminist. Yes. And many uh, professional women who read widely in the Arab world, many professional Arab women also consider themselves feminists, although they did not need the 1970s white, essentially middle class feminist movement right. to empower them. Because many women in other parts of the world, but let's just talk about the Arab countries, yeah. really uh, were part of the anti-colonial movements, right. their own governments, their own people's liberation movements. And through those movements, which were ideological as well as political, they had consciousness of liberation. The right. liberation was of the entire society, but they also benefited and became active and went into professions in which they may or may not have taken up the cause of their sisters. Right. So they don't need, and I will say we don't need, uh, white feminists, and let's be clear, it is uh, a white feminist movement, to liberate us. Still having said that, I grew up in the West, and as an anthropologist and as an educated woman, I was not liberated through a anti-colonial struggle. Right. Uh, I was um, very much empowered 
by the writings and thoughts of the Western feminists of the 1970s and 80s. And I very much benefited from that. And there are many merits to that. There are many benefits for, I would say, particularly people in this country or in Europe. But I feel that so much of what the Western feminists are doing is acting like a pa a pa the, they're very patriarchal. patronizing, right. acting very patriarchal right. towards women outside this country, maybe because they have not achieved their goals in this country. We have gained a lot in this country, let's talk about America, but in terms of our goals, we haven't. Right. I mean, you see this in terms of the image, the sexualization of women, the right. violence against women yes. in this country, the disproportionate, um, the disparities of salaries, and so on and so forth. And maybe for that reason, I don't know, but it's worthwhile looking at, I think, and examining, um, there is a tendency, very strong, to reach out to the rest of the world and identify women who have not been liberated and to go for them and to help them. Or is it not being liberated by the standards of Western feminism? Mm, maybe, maybe. But what are the standards of Western feminism? Because if you talk about sexual liberation, I don't yeah. think we have achieved here uh, a, a, the what's the standard? I'm Neither. not sure. Neither am I. You see. Is, uh, economically? We still have no. no. no so what is no it? No equal footing. You know, uh, the abuse of women that by still men goes on. Right. And uh, in any case, I think therefore the Western feminists have alienated a lot of women around the world. The movement has floundered. Um, there are individual women around the world who have joined the Western feminists right. and who have a perhaps wider uh, access, a wider, um, a larger voice internationally um, by joining an international right. movement. But I think on the whole, there's a lot of resentment created uh, by the, the victimization, the accentuation of victimization of women outside this country. Do you think that some Western feminists are trying to speak for women oh, in, the, in absolutely. the third world? It's another kind of colonialism. Right. It's the... Which they have broken away from. They managed to liberate they, themselves they from They thought the they did. Yeah. But they are part of that structure. And right. this is something they have to come to terms with. You know, I'm speaking as a sociologist. Right. I think it's natural. Why should women not also be part of the whole enslavement process? Yes. And you notice it here, white women, or let's say the feminist movement, also wants to look at the Latino woman of America or the African-American woman as the victim. And or the lower class, working class woman. Yes. Yeah. And they have alienated a lot of those women, a lot. And I've spoken with African-American women about this, and they're very resentful that often they are only given a forum in a Western feminist context when victimization is the theme right. and therefore reinforces stereotypes. Yes. And they, you know, there have been individuals right. who, again, may have benefited and come into the light, so to speak, and have themselves become reformers. Right. But in general, the class divisions remain the same, middle class women still have very lowly paid non-white workers in the house looking after their children and so forth. Right. Um, the question was posed, why women seem to need the bonds of abuse or pain to unite them together? <clears throat> Not by me. Somebody Not by else you. I mean, I'm obviously reading right. your writings on, on the internet. Mm -hmm. But a lot of women seem to feel that way. I guess maybe Western feminists feel they need this, this bond of pain or the feel the women are abused before they can unite with them. Perhaps, but I may, maybe that is part of that patriarchal view. 
Yeah. That you know, the sim we sympathize with you. Oh, you right. poor thing. And I'm sure. Tell was, us your story. I'm of sure abuse. so many we Western feminists you. would bristle at the thought that they were being Tough. Patri patriarchal. Tough. They've <laughs> got to face it. I mean, why? Why should they not have imbued all that patriarchy? that is in Christianity or other religions right. that they may be part of, which is in the economic system here, which is in right. our history. You know, we, we have to struggle with that. To what degree are we also bound up in this colonialist mentality? Why do you think it's so easy for people to fit people into stereotypes like that? It, seem, it seems to be they're doing it unconsciously. It's like almost automatic. Mm-hmm. We have to keep issues simple, more so, I think, in the West, even though we have such wide access to different r sources, whether it's research sources, whether it's general media, whether it's literature. But there's something funny in this culture, that things are reduced... In Western culture. Yes, in Western culture, to the most simplistic. You can see that happening in the health reform as it's being presented right. to the public and so many very important ideological political issues, black and white. Um, there's a reduction of things and I, I don't know why, whether it has to do with poor education here or whether it has to do with the media, you know, a, a story has to keep things simple. I mean, it's a good question. It's insulting to people. I think, there's a, I think there's, a, there's an automatic assumption that you have to keep things simple for people, mm -hmm. that people can't handle complex ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's like people at the top, um, uh, the top of the intellectual food chain or the media food chain feel that you have to keep things simple for people. Mm -hmm. I think it's very insulting for people that you have to keep things simple. It might be insulting for them, but I, are they insulted by it? Because if they were... If we unfortunately not, because I don't right. think they're aware. I don't think <laughs> right. a lot of times I don't think they're aware they're being insulted. Yes, because they're not aware there are other intellectual choices out there. Yes, they're not aware there's information for them to know. Yes, and also it's not as if you have to be a graduate student, a student to break away right. from those simplistic right. things. Right. In fact, I'm very very disappointed. I know this is a university town, uh, Richard, but very disappointed generally in the role of higher education, it, it's not reaching its potential. Uh, our universities, okay, we'll have a kind of outburst of anti-war activity right. or pro-gay and lesbian things going on in the campus, but I don't think our professors are courageous enough. It's a tough time, I think, yes, for professors. Yes. They're very conservative. There's something called Campus Watch. Yes. There are other kinds of pressures, whether they're economic, just keeping a job, because if you lose a job, where do you go? Um, which are making, uh, these people are my colleagues. Yes. Uh, making uh, professors rather conservative, and therefore the students also and we're not getting enough, again, we think we have wider access to more knowledge right. through various new technology, but if you've traveled overseas or if you know yes. other languages, you will know that we're still in the United States giving our students a very, very limited spectrum of what is published around the world. I we're, mean, most of us still only work in one language. We're giving them less and less all the time. You feel that? Yes. Why? I don't know. Why. Mm. I really don't know why. Unless mm. it's, I mean, I have, it's like you almost get into conspiracy theory time. It's because you give them less and less all the time so they will think a certain way. Mm -hmm. If you give people fewer thoughts, fewer ideas, they won't question too much. And it's almost like you're creating mm -hmm. a society in which you have uh, the worker drones, then you have the higher educated people. Mm -hmm. And that what you're giving people less and less of is, is also happening in the universities. Right. And I also, you know, again, being an anthropologist, yeah. where I am going to the guy on the street, you could say, the woman on the street for information, naturally, as an anthropologist, I have a lot of respect for popular knowledge. Yeah. 
but nevertheless, um, I don't have this sort of elitist view that a person with a master's or even a BA right. is necessarily that much smarter right. in terms of figuring out problems, media, but et cetera. Do you ever watch, do you ever watch the news? Yes. Um, it's like, do you ever watch like CNN International as compared to the American version of CNN? Yes, because I see it overseas. And American CNN is like watching something for junior high kids. And that's supposed to be a high caliber. Yes, and of they giggle. Television. They giggle like little kids. Mm -hmm. They tell stupid jokes. And it's like American news is embarrassing to watch. I was watching a British correspondent on The Daily Show last year, and she said, if I had to watch American news, I'd shoot myself in the head. And because, I mean, it's embarrassing to watch American news because it's horrific. Because um, at, at any moment, they're turning to Twitter and they're saying, well, let's see what people are telling right. us on Twitter. It's like, no, you moron, tell me what's on the news, you know? Yes. And, and, I mean, the news is horrific in this country. And it's like, it's like, I don't trust the news because I think they're stupid too, you know? I don't think we're getting news from very intelligent people for the most part, very well-informed people. And compared to CNN International? Well, they seem more knowledgeable. They seem, they seem more articulate. They don't giggle like school kids. And the interviews are much longer. Yes, it's like watching a BBC. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much more coherent. And I get, you get, you get a much more broader view of the world and you, you sit there and you go, why isn't this covered on American news where they have to, they have to end each newscast with happy news, you know? Or how much things are right. better in America. Or something uplifting. They have to tell you something uplifting, you know? Uh, to get back to um, the view of people in the, in the Middle East, um, you think some of this is deliberate though, the way we're looking at people in the Middle East, it's not accidental. Absolutely. Absolutely deliberate. Part of it is related, I think, to the alliance yeah. America has to maintain with Israel and the very yeah. positive image of Israel as a democracy. Isra Israelis keep talking about that, and after all, how can you prove it except by contrasting it with countries nearby who right. are the enemy of right. Israel. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, that's a fact. I mean, we've seen, we see daily the reaffirmations of the alliance, and we also hear daily that Israel is the only democracy in that area. And I think that that is just part of the commitment right. that American media has. Yes. Um, and then there have been a lot of wars in that area, whether or not they're related to Israel or to other factors. And maybe uh, the involvement of the U.S. in wars or against certain groups has to also be reinforced right. by presenting people there as a threat. And, uh, you know, there's a certain point. I mean, it's just rolling. Right. And you cannot break it. Right. And it's like almost every year there's a new region of threat, whether it's Somalia or Yemen. And then it's more exciting. Let's yeah. face it. War is fun at one level. It's, you know, people won't like me using that word. It's entertaining. It really is entertaining. I mean, maybe gets, many listeners gets, will not remember, but it, you will when... Yeah. The bombings occur over Baghdad, right. they are described by correspondents as lighting up like a Christmas tree. Right. I mean, you are describing the murder of people as those bombs are dropping. They don't talk about that. Right. So, so war is, is exciting. I don't want to say it's fun, but it's entertaining and war involvement right. is very much a part of American life. And we have to believe in America that we are on the good side. I mean, after all, why spend so much money? Why send our boys out and girls out there to be involved? There is a war machine going and there's on. A, there's an inherent belief that God is on our side. Mm -hmm. Very there's much an, embedded God in God is on our side. Right, right. right. So it also builds up 
sense of patriotism. Right. I mean, many people, whether you're talking about New York City or Fayetteville, are very proud of yeah. the job our troops are doing. Right. And it's amazing, isn't it, to see that allocations of money are easily passed through Congress at a time when, look at the fight we've just had over s some small increase in health reform costs. Very small. Yeah, very, very small, small compared to the war. So, um, as some many writers have said, whether they're writers observing from overseas or whether they're a few Americans, the uh, confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Cold War ended. And our culture thrives on conflict or the image of conflict. And we need an enemy. Right. We need that sense of the threat to America, the greatness of America. If America is great, what is it great versus? Right. If America needs to be stronger, why does it need to be stronger? It's under threat from outside. Right now, there are threats not being posed, although it's on the horizon with um, Venezuela. Uh, Hugo Chavez, is he the yeah. president of Venezuela? But that area of the world, even Cuba, is left alone while we concentrate on the threats coming out of the Middle East. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a slight undertone, maybe it's not slight, of racism involved in this. Thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's not easy to argue that, but the terms being used by our soldiers without question of raghead and haji towards uh, people that they've occupied, um, jihadi, you know, really the way they say these words, they are criminalizing our language at you the see same these, time. You see these words used by people in letters to the editor. Yes. And publishers print them. Yes. I mean, without questioning. And they right. wouldn't publish terms about people of Hispanic descent or black descent. Or, but, but, or, or Jewish. Right. But they, or they Catholic. think nothing of printing them about people yes. from the Middle East. Yes. So they pass. Yeah. And that is a clear indication of the racism inherent in it. Right. An editor or a host will say, hey, wait a minute, what did you just say? Right. Um, these things pass and they they will use terms like she's known as jihadi jane well who said jihadi jane right or who said chemical alley right. you know known as chemical alley right uh, <laughs> they, they pass and yeah. and these are probably embedded yeah. in the language by maybe policy makers right uh, by people who feed information uh, right to the press, and then the press picks it up, and you never quite know the origin of it. It right. could have just been a journalist looking for a colorful term, and then it's it becomes the label. Exactly. And um, and there is a clear um, color issue there yeah. too. Um, the swarthy Arab, the dark beard, um, the dark clothes, um, no smiling faces. Right. I recall an image of uh, Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, on the cover of a major weekly. And if it was touched up or not, I mean, you can you have a range of pictures of any right. public figure, and you can choose among them. And it is a scary picture. Right. <laughs> you know? So how do people, maybe Western feminists or anyone else, how do people learn to unlearn and then relearn? about the perceptions about the Middle East? Well, you know, I, I have said, and even though this is not very practical, but the best um, way to get to know somebody from yeah. another culture is to marry them. And marriages create children uh, who have both cultures. And generally, a person goes with their spouse back to visit the grandparent, right. and so on and so forth. And not many of us can do that. I don't believe tourism. Not without multiple marriages. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, um, uh, tourism, I, uh, you know, is promoted as a way to break down cultures. Yeah. From what I've seen in India and Nepal and China, it is sometimes the reverse. Really? Yeah. 
I, I, interestingly, I mean, you have these ecotourism and all yeah. this sort of thing. And, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, rubbing shoulders with tourists. And I am generally not impressed by the views that they return home with because there's this kind of tendency to uh, anecdotalize your holiday uh, and you're talking often about people in, in, in servile positions yeah vis-a-vis -vis you whether it's a Jamaican who's serving you rum right. or whether it's a Sherpa who's bringing you fried eggs at 20,000 feet altitude um, and the salary the price differences you know uh, people who work in tourism right who are face to face like one-to-one -one with the tourists are off, often getting very low salaries. Yes. So that's a whole other issue. But, you know, people are inspired. It's, it's nice. Young people are inspired all the time by movies they see. Maybe not so much movies, but television documentaries right. they see or books. Still, still works. Right. Books still work. Books they've read. Uh, or images they see in National Geographic or something that inspire them to learn a language. That's, that's, that's a real way to break down right. uh, boundaries and stereotypes. Inspires young people to learn a language and to go maybe alone backpacking or to take up anthropology or history or something like that. I don't, I don't see any evidence, however, Richard, that People today, yeah. young people, students I deal with, are more um, in touch with really? other people in the world than they were 50, 60 years ago. That's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. Do you think, well, maybe I'm wrong. No, I th no, what I do you think? I think you're probably right. You know, I was raised I mean, in the military. You were raised in a military that was, that family? Was, actually, that was the one really good thing about uh, us being living overseas was because we had a chance to if you were if you were really smart you got a chance to to mingle with people mm. of other cultures you know mm. a lot of people never did a lot of people just stayed on base all the time but if you were if you were smart uh -huh. you got a chance to to experience uh, other uh -huh. cultures uh -huh. and then you're reminding me then in the second world war a lot of our soldiers married german when they were stationed in Germany and married Japanese, right? My, my, my father married a woman from England when he was stationed right. okay. in England, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much that is happening in today's occupied lands, I'm not sure. I don't know. But, um, you know, that's a real question we have to think about seriously. I mean, we are sending young people. They go for semesters to Europe and now quite a few to the Middle East because American... Right. Colleges are really pushing Arabic language training, and yeah. American universities are setting up new campuses. All oh, there's this is a whole neo-colonial process, right. by the way, that has is related yes. to the occupation of Iraq and essentially the occupation of some of the Gulf states. Uh, hopefully, it it could. But again, I know Westerners who work in the Arab Gulf states, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And now their salaries are just out of the roof. Really? Just astronomical. You know, they're getting big, big bucks, which again separate them from even middle class right. uh, Emiratis or oh, Amman people. Yeah. You know, I don't see that much. You know, I've, I've been, I was in Amman right. a few weeks ago and in Damascus a few weeks ago. And I, there are a few book clubs, for example, of people who are mixed yeah. Arab and American or British. It's very limited. Wow. Speaking of books, you wrote a book called uh, Swimming Up the Tigris. Yes. And that was a book about uh, people who are living under the sanctions in Iraq. Right. Now, we're talking about after the first Gulf War. Right. Which, 1991. Right, which a lot of people say, what? There was a war? Indeed. In 1991? What was that about, you know? It's been pretty well wiped off, certainly out of the media. It's been wiped out of, and I think intentionally, yeah. out of discussions of the current war in Iraq and occupation of Iraq. And the, there were quite a few good books of that period, but they've all been eclipsed by these 
Uh, exposés, soldier stories, a lot of soldiers' autobiographies, which again, war, nice, you know, real right. guts and blood, and we've yeah. got films now, award-winning films. But that period from 1991, 1990 really, to 2003, the invasion uh, on the ground of Amer Amer by American forces in Iraq, I think is very important, not just because I wrote the book about it. I mean, the reason I wrote the book is because it has to be part of U.S. history right. in that area. And I think it was a softening up right. of that, as they say, the war theater. I mean, these terms, the theater of war. I know. And whether it was intended to bring down the Ba'ath regime, led by Saddam Hussein or not, uh, it did not bring it down. It, in fact, made Saddam Hussein's government more paranoid, more oppressive on its own people. More because brutal, yes. Clinton himself announced that there were CIA operations in the country during the 1990s to undermine the government. So, what, you know, if you a, know... What a clever thing to do. Yes. Yeah. And they're beaming radio, you know, X million dollars placed in countries around Iraq right. beaming uh, radio, TV programs, uh, encouraging people to up, uh, rise up and overthrow their government. So what do you think it's going to do with the government? Right. Make I mean, here paranoid. in the United States, after 2001, we had the passage of the Patriot Act, which has greatly right. restricted our civil rights. Yes. So what's it going to do in a place outside here? So, um, so we were responsible. By we, I mean the, the U.S. government right. was responsible for famine conditions created in a country which was very advanced, had a very high level of health, of uh, literacy, etc. In fact, 1988, at the end of Iraq, I believe 19, 1988, Iraq had been involved in a, a six-year war with Iran, right. encouraged by the United States. Yes. In fact. Um, perhaps even instigated by the United States. It was called the War of Attrition. It right. was like, let them kill each other. It was dual containment. I mean, these again, these terms, dual containment, you know, keep the two of them uh, non-threatening to the rest of the world by battling each other and killing each other. And as our former State Department head said, Henry Kissinger, he said, I hope they both lose. I mean, these are the words of criminals, you know, yes. and yet such powerful people in, who remain today in this country. Anyway, um, it was a, a policy to destroy Iraq uh, from the inside. We had bombed Iraq for 42 days in 1991, right. and that was theoretically to drive Iraqi forces from Kuwait, right. which they had occupied. Uh, foolishly, perhaps they were entrapped, it doesn't matter, but it served uh, the purpose of uh, making Iraq appear to be a threat to the world. Right. And Kuwait, which it seemed no American knew about before, suddenly became the place to be liberated. Yeah. And uh, within weeks um, of that, the in fact within days, the, the imposition of sanctions, probably the most severe sanctions in the history of mankind, laying a country of 20 million people under siege. And the terms of that siege, led by the United States and policed by it, uh, which were, was also sanctioned by the United Nations, is such that Americans really have to look at that and remember it and see what our government was capable of. And most of that siege that embargo of 13 years was implemented during the Clinton administration. And yet there was so little coverage of that. Well, and, it may and, seem so. I guess so. Well, and not... At I mean, the time. At the time. Even, right. even now, hardly anybody talks about it. Nobody like, talks about it now. It's collective amnesia. Right. Uh, and part of policy. Yes. When anybody talks about Iraq and its population and, and the devastation and the deaths, they are talking about deaths post... 2003 invasion. Right. They are not talking about perhaps two million Iraqis who died and as Kathy Kelly, the head of 
Voices in the Wilderness, which once led an anti-sanctions, anti-embargo movement, right. which was very weak, I have to admit, and we failed. And I was part of it. As a journalist, many of us were against those sanctions. Kathy Kelly called the embargo against Iraq yeah. a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah. And even a biological weapon because the, the earth was polluted. The water was polluted. Um, the food was weak, it was absent. Yeah. And the disease that was created by the absence of medicines and the greater degree of pollution, et cetera, et cetera, killed many, 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 up to 2,000. Those records, Richard, were all destroyed when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. So the papers, which were painstakingly assembled to, to expose that, but also for Iraqis yeah. to study and to have a record of the deaths and the deterioration, et cetera, et cetera, went poof. Yeah. And also there were maybe as many as four million Iraqis who fled the country during that period, mainly the middle class. Right. Because the university system broke down, there were no jobs for engineers, you had no technology. So middle class depends very, very much, much right. on technology. Doctors left because yeah. the hospitals collapsed, etc., yeah. etc. Psychiatrists I know left. So you had the bleeding of the country at that time. These days you may, people who are interested, may hear that there are four to six million Iraqis who fled the country, Yeah, mainly the better educated, that does not count those who were forced out as refugees before 2003. Right. The maybe one and a half million who've been killed by this current war and invasion do also do not count the two million before that. Right. That's just amazing. It's, it's, I, I mean, but the information is there if people want to find it. Right. If they, maybe if they know the information is there, they can find it. Yes. Um, there are enough books about it. Yeah. Ramsey Clark reported on it very well in a book called The Fire This Time. There's my book. Uh, there's another uh, collection called Metal of Dishonor, which was about depleted uranium, uh, again published by the International Action Center in New York. But there really wasn't much being produced in those 13 years. And people told me when I was heading for Iraq, I went 40 yeah. some odd times during that period. They'd say, how can you go to Iraq? Like, how do you get a visa? I mean, because there was a sense in this country right. that you could not get into Iraq because the American government did not want us to go. For some, Forgetting that it's the Iraqi government who issues visas. Because for so many, pe <laughs> for so many people, Barbara, it's like, even to consider this material is to consider the American government may have done something wrong. Yes. And they cannot go there. They're, they're yes, emotionally and intellectually, they cannot go to this place. Yes. And they, they won't allow themselves to go to this place. Yes. And um, that period also, uh, the Clinton administration was culpable. Yes. So there are many of us who just want to blame Bush and the Republicans. So we also won't go there because the Clinton administration and the Democratic Party was part and parcel of that entire right. policy. Just one other final point on that, Richard. What I, why I think this is also important is to understand how murderous sanctions can be. It's, it's very nebulous sanctions. Oh, yeah. You know, you don't see the blood flowing and it's yeah. not as dramatic. No Although we were bombing Iraq on a regular right. basis during that period, uh, but, but it is a murderous war and it is a strategy that can be very effective. And it is a strategy which we are implementing against Iran right. and other countries today. I mean, we essentially destroyed Vietnam right. with a 20 year policy yeah. of sanctions. And then Iran came around and like it's today, we're great friends. And they, by, by the time we lifted the sanctions, they had completely capitalize their economy right. and so on and so forth. So even though militarily the United States lost against Vietnam yeah. by the use of sanctions afterwards, and, and it's, it's also shameful to see 
and, and instructive to see to what degree the world bends to the will of America. I know. When America says you cannot send pencils, medicine, basic other kinds of goods to that country, most of the world complies. That's, that's insane. And I'm talking about what who we think are yeah. countries with alternative policies towards the world. Yeah. I'm talking about the European countries. They all caved in to the United States. When America said, you, if you fly your planes into Baghdad, you will not have landing rights in the United States. Well, that's just insane. And they, all these countries capitulated. That's just insane. No one would trade with Iraq. I know, that's just insane. I'll tell you what else is insane. Our director is pounding on the glass right now. He's, he's, he's telling me our time <laughs> An is hour's up. Half. He's telling me our uh, time over. is up. So, anyway, well, it's been well, very enjoyable. Well, Barbara, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you, Richard. I've enjoyed it immensely. All right, I want to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next week. I'm Adam Firecat, and I'm public access, and so are you. You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. And to follow the swimming rules. You're always looking out for me and trying to keep me safe. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? Here in the garage. Closet. Show box under the bed where anyone can get to it. How safe is that? How safe is that? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules. Now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. If you own a firearm and are not using it, please be responsible and be sure that it's stored in a safe place. Remember, always. Lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. Newsflash! 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 Newsflash!
I got Brother Bill's bass on the back. I'm born playing on the drums. You know that feel when we all get together. It's a boogie woogie son of a gun. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. You can boogie woogie all night long. Dr. Blue's blowing on the horn. All our friends and neighbors start to gather round. Seems everybody wants to get a little closer to the back porch boogie boogie sound. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. You can boogie boogie all night long. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. is on the next CD. It's called I Think You Think Too Hard. You were walking down that highway and then my feet told me not to follow. Your heart in its patient agony laughing at me as a spoon. Everything you see I think 
think you think too hard This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There is still a power in the earth no man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There's still a power in the world, no man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. Yes, it is true. There really are people in power who are nothing but schoolyard bullies, stupid and rude. And they're pushing on you, not even for their But they can't hold a candle to you when you stand with your feet firm on the path you love and to power in your path. To power. To power. To power. This is not a time for to not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There's still a power in the earth. No man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. All around you, people can look you in the eye, tell you powers to rise, leave you confused. So what can you do? Power is not its own and aim higher, my friend, and it'll come true. Because they can't hold a candle to you when you stand. If you think firm on the path you love and to power in your hand. To power. To This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There's still a power in the air. No man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There is still a power in the earth no man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. Take courage, be not afraid. Politics in general and jobs that don't pay enough 40 hours. Work weeks, books full of boring stuff, schools that should teach, but kids don't learn a thing. These are a few of my least favorite things. Healthcare that won't heal and how people treat the earth, paying tolls and taxes, disbelief in self-worth, bitter cold winters that cut into spring. These are a few of my least favorite things. Religions that claim they're true, don't get me started. Standards that double and people cold hearted. Judgment and bias when freedom don't ring. These are a few of my least favorite things. All the lying, all the killing, when I'm depressed and sad. I add that to all of my least favorite things, and then I feel really bad. <laughs> I feel like Julie Andrews or something.